Libya's government forces claim they have taken control of the opposition stronghold Bani Walid, but say pockets of resistance still remain. That's after a weeks-long deadly assault with reports of dozens of residents in the besieged city being killed by pro-government shelling. Artis Paula Sleer has the details. We continue to receive these conflicting reports. From our sources on the ground, we're hearing that the army is actually withdrawing from the city, although we are hearing of wide-scale killings. From the government sources, they say that the city has fallen. We continue to receive unverified video footage as well as reports of wide-scale killings, of indiscriminate shelling, and also the use of poisonous gas. Some of the photos and video we've been receiving show dismembered bodies, children who've been killed, and some of that footage which is coming from Bani Walid television that has been broadcasting these visuals almost non-stop. There is still a question mark over whether or not chemical weaponry has been used. Doctors at the scene do report that many of the patients they are treating are suffering from toxic gas inhalation and certainly we're hearing the same kind of thing from eyewitnesses. But again, we are receiving unconfirmed reports that many of the shells are being fired with gas inside them. As of yet, we cannot independently verify this. The fighting has been going on now for the better part of three weeks. And in that time, all communication in and outside the city has been hampered. It took us several days to make contact with people inside the besieged city. They told us that these army forces were manning all the entrances and exits to and from Bani Walid. This despite the fact that thousands of people have fled to neighboring sites and refugee camps. We have managed to make contact with a man in Europe who's asked us to hide his identity because he is afraid for his family who are still inside Bani Walid. He tells us that the army is pushing back. He also says quite alarmingly that he hasn't heard from his family for several days and he's incredibly fearful as to their fate. The militias fall back after uh, the the fight that happened yesterday. They ran away from the from the from the city there, and everything is good. Banu Walid people control all over Banu Walid, and uh, the militias they kidnapped the council member there, and uh, his health is really bad, and they will take him to Masrata. He's a really old man, and he's a really good man. And he did not do anything. He. He doesn't have any guilty about what's happening in Bani Walid. He's just a council member. People die. The number is really big. On the first day that they come in, uh, I think about what, seven, 70 body from the militias, and the number go on to be big till yesterday. Yesterday night, it been 600 from the militias on the wild of Bani Walid and on the street of the middle of the city in Bani Walid. Certainly ever since the violence started some three weeks ago, residents of Bani Walid have been appealing to the international community for assistance. Moscow took up this call by drafting a statement that it put forward to the United Nations Security Council earlier this week, but that was blocked by the United States, prompting a response from Moscow saying that it found this odd and strange and it couldn't actually understand and why such a statement had not been approved. It's also caused many in the international community to accuse both Washington and others of double standards. You need to remember it wasn't so long ago that Russia and China were blamed for voting against resolutions in Libya. And now the question is being asked, well, why, when Moscow puts forward for calling for assistance in Bani Walid, is this being stopped by Washington? Paula Slear there. Well, Artie's managed to make contact with an eyewitness in the city. She says militias are carrying out mass killings as civilians continue to call on the international community to help. These are not governmental forces. There are militias and armed gangsters surrounding Bani Walid without any legitimacy. The media is prohibited from reporting on what's happening in the city. The situation is horrible. Crimes are committed. Communications were deliberately cut in order for these gangsters to prevent any person from communicating what's really happening. They are bulldozing houses. They are setting houses on fire, stealing everything they find. Moreover, they've committed massacres, killing as many people as they could. People here in Bani Walid want to return to their homes. They say that their city is totally destroyed. Nevertheless, they want to go back and live in the wreckage. They refuse to be driven out of the city. Secondly, they request all humanitarian organizations, including the UN, to come to Bani Walid and see the destruction for themselves and see the devastation. We need immediate aid. We need humanitarian assistance urgently. Let's get more reaction on that from journalist and author Neil Clark. He joins us from London. Well, we've just been hearing that eyewitness report. 
yet there's been no international response to the fact that civilians are being killed in Bani Walid, especially from those states that backed the revolution in Libya a year ago. Why do you think that is? Isn't it interesting, Bill? Let's think back to February 2011. We couldn't pick up a newspaper in the UK or the US or put on the BBC or CNN without hearing about what was going on in Libya. The humanitarian disaster, we were told. Colonel Gaddafi's forces were killing lots of people. There were dangers of a massive massacre in Benghazi. And because of that, we went to war. That, that was the reason for war. And today, the situation in Libya is much worse. We've got a humanitarian catastrophe taking place. The number of people killed since NATO intervened has gone up by between 10 and 20 times. We've got massacres going on at the moment, and uh, there's silence, complete silence here in the UK and in the US. Well, what about human rights, that though? That, the human rights, that organisation, that's normally listened to, isn't it? Three weeks on, I have to say, well, it is three weeks on. The, the, the human rights yeah. is actually now raising its voice to what's going on there. Perhaps it could have done it a bit earlier, yeah. really. But why is that then, by well, all accounts, being ignored? It tells us it all, doesn't it, Bill? I mean, Amnesty International has been very good on Libya. They've been talking about the number of detentions that have taken place there under the new regime. But, of course, the Western powers aren't interested. They got what they want, what, what they wanted. They got rid of Gaddafi. They've got a pro-Western government in power now in Tripoli. They're taking control of the oil industry. There's privatisation. Western corporations are moving in. And they don't really give a toss, to be honest, about what's going on, about, about the human rights abuses, the fact that demonstrations are banned throughout the country. It's time to move on, on to Syria, of course. Well, uh, let's talk about the diplomatic tensions too. On Tuesday, the US blocked Russia's diplomatic efforts in the UN Security Council to resolve that conflict yeah. peacefully in Bani Walid. Why is that? Well, again, Russia, let's think back to what was it last October when Russia and China vetoed the very, uh, I think, warlike resolution for, for, from the Western powers over Syria, which would have paved the way for intervention there. And Russia and China were demonized in the Western media. Here we have Russia uh, coming up with something very constructive, a, a very, very pro-peace uh, statement which should have been supported. And of course, uh, the, the US turns it down. So I think it shows to everybody now, surely, the, the gross hypocrisy of the US and its allies in all of this. They use this sort of humanitarian excuses for an excuse to, uh, the humanitarian factors to, to, as an excuse to intervene militarily to topple governments which don't do the bidding of the West and Israel. They did it in Yugoslavia in 99, they did it in Iraq, of course, they did it in Libya last year, and they're trying to do it again in Syria. But they won't be doing this in Bahrain, where there's been massive human rights abuses. They won't be doing it against Saudi Arabia, where there is no democracy, where human rights are very poor. And they won't be doing it, of course, against Israel, because, of course, we've got the situation in Gaza, described as the largest prison camp in the world. I don't think we'll be hearing from Hillary Clinton or William Hague how we've got to intervene against Israel somehow. What about the suspicions that chemical weapons could have been used on civilians in the besieged city? We're getting some pretty clear evidence that perhaps that yeah. is the case. If it is true, any difference to an international reaction then? That surely would be stronger, wouldn't it? Well, you would think so, but I don't think so, because, of course, you know, any time there is any hint that Syrian government has got chemical weapons, it's front page news. It's on all the Western news channels. But, of course, RT is about the only channel that's taking up this story about chemical weapons being used here uh, at the moment in Libya. It's just not news. Chemical weapons are only news when it's an opponent of the West that, 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 that may be using them. That's it. When that happens, it's front page news, of course. And, of course, they only have to be using them. We've got the Iraqi WMD hoax, one of the biggest conspiracy theories of all time. Saddam didn't have WMD. He didn't have those weapons, and yet it was still front page news. Journalist, author Neil Clark, joining us live there from the UK. Thank you very much indeed for your thoughts.